The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Welcome to Compass, a production from Pioneer Public Television. I'm Les Heen, your host for Compass. This is a weekly discussion of public policy and important issues facing our viewing area. This week, the restoration efforts facing our rivers, lakes, and wetlands across the region. One large example is the Marsh Lake Project on the Upper Minnesota River. This project will start this year now that $7.6 million in federal funds have been approved. First, a closer look on the ground at the Marsh Lake Project and how it will affect the area around it. Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser recently visited the Marsh Lake area and filed this report. Marsh Lake Ecosystem Restoration Project has been in the works for over 20 years, but it became more of a formal project in the past decade with the partnership between the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Minnesota DNR, and the Upper Minnesota River Watershed Districts. Here's the story. This project uh, came about because the Corps owns fee title ownership to the dam. So the state of Minnesota, to be able to work with the Corps of Engineers, we had to go through a very formal process. And even before that began, the, the Minnesota DNR had to get together, or our project teams, our fisheries people, our wildlife people, our ecological and water resources team, all had to come together and kind of get an agreement for what the vision is for the Marsh Lake system. That wasn't as easy process as it was sound. Uh, I represent the section of wildlife. I could have came in, what's best for wildlife? And our major constituents on Marsh Lake are duck hunters. And fisheries could have came in with their focus on, well, what does this project mean for walleyes and northern, northern pike? And our ecological and water resources staff could have came on board, you know, what does this mean for river systems or river processes? So to be honest with you, we had two years of internal discussions and I think finally it came to the point of let's just focus on the total ecosystem health. What do we need to do across the board and not let worry about the duck hunters versus the fishermen versus the canoeists. And once we came to that realization, the whole project came together. Historically, the Marsh Lake Dam was built in the 1930s as part of the Lacaparo Flood Control Project that erected a number of dams including the Lacaparo Dam and Highway 75 Dam, to name a few. Like most dams, it changed the way Marsh Lake worked, not necessarily for the better. Historically, the Palm de Terre River came into the Minnesota River right where we're standing today. This is when the river coming in. Behind me is the Minnesota River. Marsh Lake is part of a, the Minnesota River, if you will. So when they put the Palm de Terre River in the Marsh Lake, they cut it off from this historic channel. So we'll start with a loss of floodplain connectivity. We cut off the floodplain. Uh, it changed the way fish utilize the area. It changed the way sediment moves in the river systems and other aquatic organisms. I tell people marsh lake didn't decline overnight. We're not gonna be able to rehabilitate it overnight. It's gonna take some time. But I think while we're learning how Marsh Lake responds to our management, then we got to start having the broader conversation on how does that fit in with the operation of Lacaparral Dam, the Highway 75 Dam, and maybe even the dam on Big Stone Lake. Because eventually, the big scheme would be that they're all kind of interconnected. When we're doing a drawdown on Marsh Lake, we're holding you know, water levels at you know, such and such elevation on Lacaparral Lake, and maybe there's some benefits we can get there for fish spawning. And then the Highway 75 Dam. So having all those systems be interconnected and kind of working together is the ultimate long-term goal. 65% of the $12.93 million project will come from federal funding, while 35% will come from the state of Minnesota. 
Compared to other projects this size, Marsh Lake is one of the best in terms of habitat units gained versus initial cost, even despite the three phases incorporated in the project. We'll start with putting the Palm de Terre River into its original channel. We're going to reconnect the floodplain. So when you have a flood event, that's what rivers do. They flood, they go into their floodplain, the sediments deposited on the floodplain. So we're going to get that reconnection back. Because that old embankment is going to be removed, so the floodplains were stored. Obviously, the Palm de Terre River comes into its original channels. Those channels are still there. We'll just need to do some excavation further down. So we're putting back the floodplain. We're putting back the river process. And then we're also putting in the fish connectivity. Fish that are in Lac Pro Lake will be able to move up into the Minnesota River. They'll be able to move up in the Palm de Terre River. The whole aquatic ecosystem is going to benefit by getting that floodplain and that direct connectivity into the Palm de Terre River. So that was that one phase. The other phase that we're looking at is over my shoulder. And I always tell people that was a death knell for Marsh Lake when that was put in because natural systems fluctuate. Dry years, drought years, you get a drawdown, you get mud flats. High water years, you have flooding going on. But when that structure went in over my shoulder, that hydrology changed. It became flat line and flooding. So what we're doing here is we're going to notch that crest and we're going to put in a Rock Rapids fishway. The fishway will allow connectivity 100% of the time from Lac Pro Lake into Marsh Lake. Right now, Marsh Lake has cut off connectivity except during flood events. So the third big project feature is the drawdown structure, which is going to be further to the west. Now what the drawdown structure is going to do is going to give us the ability to do a targeted water level drawdown. And those drawdowns are critical to shift the state from a dirty water, turbid condition, into a clear water state. And you do that by lowering the water levels. You're going to get mud flats. You're going to get vegetation growing on those mud flats. You're going to get consolidation of the bottom sediments, but you're also going to get more light penetration into the water column, and we want to get more submerged aquatic vegetation back in the marsh lake. Now, the good news is the project's going to touch all that. If you're a duck hunter on marsh lake, you're going to see your cattail beds restored. You're going to see your submergent uh, vegetation come back, and I'll guarantee there'll be more ducks on this lake than we've seen in the past 20 years, especially in years when we're doing a drawdown. For our fishermen on the lake, it's probably going to change the way you fish here at the Marsh Lake Dam with the fishway. That's going to change it. Right now, this is a barrier to fish movement. Fish congregate here. When there's that fishway, you're going to have connectivity. Hopefully, you're going to have greater natural reproduction in the system. But I have all the confidence in the world. Fishermen will figure out the, how to catch fish. And if you're worried about the riverine process and canoeing and outdoor recreation, we're doing good things on that end, too. So I said holistic vision towards more of a clear water state and an improved condition over where it's at today. With us now to talk about the restoration steps still ahead, we have Diane Rodebacher from the Upper Minnesota River Watershed District and Dwight Howell with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Diane, Dwight, thanks for joining us on Compass. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, this local project uh, very close to where we are sitting right now in Appleton, Minnesota, is a, you know, a big deal for the people in Appleton and for the people who are concerned about the Upper Minnesota River. But what about beyond that? I mean, is this an example of what we're seeing, of course, in a lot of other areas, the removal of dams and restoration of rivers? Is this a fairly common thing? And, and Dwight, I'd like to start with you on that. Oh, yes, uh, Les, first of all, thanks for having me. But um, this is something that's common across the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, something that we're um, looking back at the different projects we've done, um, looking at new areas and working with uh, local communities and municipalities um, to you know, restore the ecosystem um, and so that's something that we're doing, um, just not in Minnesota, but really across the United States. 
yeah, hundreds of projects, uh, you know, or, th or even a thousand or so I've heard that can be across the United States. And Diane, for you, Upper Minnesota River, you've been doing this for decades, and you've been, been in Ortonville for a long time. Is this exciting to see this happen? Very exciting. And I, I know for our local DNR Fisheries Department, this is something they've wanted to see for a long time, the removal of these structures and the actual restoration of Marsh Lake. And let's talk about fisheries for a moment, since you brought that up. I know some people get kind of scared because they think, well, wherever this dam is, that's where I've fished for years, and why do they have to change it, and I like it here. Uh, and they're concerned about what's going to happen to the fish. But what does happen when one of these dams is removed? What does happen to the and fish? And actually, the removal of this dam, they're actually putting in a fishway, which will prevent the rough fish from actually getting back into Marsh Lake, which should improve the water quality, which should improve the fishing within Marsh Lake. So, yeah, so in other words, what happens is we've seen in the case of Marsh Lake or other places, you may see um, you know, a lot of turbidity in the water, water gets churned up, more rush fi rough fish, not as many game fish, that kind of thing? Yes, and absolutely, and then that hurts the vegetation within the basin, which then reflects back on your flyway and your birding and everything else. So uh, a great segue there to the fact that we've got, of course, concerns about waterfowl, because I know Dwight, before we started here, we were talking about the fact that people who look at the Minnesota River or some areas, they may see, what happened to the flyway? Because we used to have, you know, things were different, we had more. How do projects like this affect flyways for waterfowl? Um, I, I think uh, specifically with the Marsh Lake Ecosystem Restoration Project that it's actually going to um, bring back a lot more migratory birds and more diverse species because, well, with the res restoration of the palm de terre, with the fish passage, with the... Um, you know, sediment uh, resuspension and elimination, a lot of those other factors, we're actually making it better for the aquatic vegetation and that sediment uh, loading. And so what that's really going to do is it actually makes it a more conducive um, environment for that migratory waterfowl um, to come and visit us. Um, and, you know, and also that, that goes into, you know, better hunting. You talked about sediment, so does that mean you're talking about when the dam is removed, then there are obviously issues with sediment behind the dam, and it takes a while for that to work through. Is that what that means? Uh, no. Um, do you, you want to No, go, go ahead. Okay. No, what, what we're saying is, is actually by a restoration efforts, we're actually making, uh, we're making it better. So we also will have a water drawdown control structure, so we'll be able to really manage the water levels. So... In the winter, or more with the growing seasons, as we lower um, the water levels, that actually helps to settle um, the sediment. And by that sediment, you know, settling with the, you know, it's better for the aquatic vegetation to stabilize the soil, which will bring in the migratory fowl. So it's actually, you know, we're making it better, you know, in all accounts. So how long does it take to make it better? I mean, because people, people talk about it takes a long time mm -hmm. to get one of these projects planned, funded, and done. When it is done, is there a transition time where you say, okay, now we think things are kind of to where they should be. Is that a year, two years? How long does it take? Diana. Yeah, they're, they're thinking that you could see results in as early as two to three years, but I think there's actually a monitoring plan that they're working on, and so that has kind of like um, some particular points that they're looking at that they're going to recognize, like goals and objectives. Okay. And so through this plan, I believe it's, five years, six year plan, something like that, and they will have all these goals that they're going to try to meet. So it's kind of like giving them some idea of how much improvement they're seeing. So in other words, how do we measure success? Yes, yes, so absolutely. Success, success could be measured by numbers of waterfowl, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. changes in the fish populations. Mm -hmm. What else? Those the two primary Water quality, ones? quality, you know, the um, actual vegetation, what you get for regrowth, what kinds of vegetation you get. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at some of the history of the project here and I saw that uh, when this project was first recommended for study, it was 1962. And I know people around here have been talking about it for a long time, as with so many projects. So it takes a long time for these projects to go from a study phase, maybe not 50 years, but from a study phase to, to more study to then funding to actually happen. And it begs the question, what do we know now about a lot of these kinds of projects that we didn't know in the 20s or 30s when these dams were built? What, what do we know now? Dwight? Well, well, Les, I think the big thing is in the 20s and 30s when a lot of these projects went in, it was more about flood protection. And it was protecting the populace and protecting the grounds. And I think through the years we saw the adverse effects of, you know, potentially blindly just looking at one factor and not really looking at the ecosystem. So now it's a big job for us to revisit, you know, these areas and be like, okay, well, by doing this, 
we messed this up, so we need to fix this. And so we're trying to get back to fixing, you know, what we broke. Yeah. And, and for, for the Upper Minnesota River, of course, um, you know, this was just one of a number of different projects on the Minnesota River, right? So, yes. uh, Diane, you're at the Headwaters River. What can people expect downstream from, from fixing what may have been messed up? What, what should happen is they should see improvements, especially in their water quality, and then their fishing, hunting, everything else, because this is region-wide. This, this covers a huge area for the amount of people that visit actually Marsh Lake and this whole upper basin. Yeah, and for our viewers who may not be familiar with the area, we're talking about Marsh Lake. This is an area 150 miles northwest of the Twin Cities, upper Minnesota River Valley, not that far downriver from the headwaters. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, an up, it's a part of the river that many people like to hunt and fish in, mm -hmm. but people from the Twin Cities or from southern Minnesota may not have visited. Correct. And, you know, like Big Stone Lake is the headwaters, and... We're only located 27 miles upstream from here, so this is all basically connected. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there have been other examples, I think, in the, within the Minnesota River watershed or other watersheds of smaller rivers, because, of course, the Minnesota River is the one that gets a lot of attention. But is the same kind of idea something that we're seeing on a lot of smaller rivers, tributaries, and what sort of effects are we seeing there? And Dwight, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay, yes, um, I think you're correct. You know, when we focus, we look like stuff like the, the Minnesota, the Missouri, uh, the Mississippi, those are the large bodies, but we all know that there's many tributary smaller rivers that feed into them. And sometimes the key to success is sometimes not the big river, but it's what feeds into it. And so, you know, for this case, uh, with the Palm de Terre River, you know, we're fixing what feeds into it, which then improves the quality of, you know, the Minnesota. So. Um, it's something that we're looking at, and we're looking at things at a system, um, you know, as a watershed, you know, looking at the basin. Sure. And the Palm de Terre and the Chippewa are a couple of the tributaries yeah. on the Upper Minnesota River, so those would be examples of where there have been some control structures removed over recent years. And I think from looking at this at a national level, we also see flood control here, whereas in the western states it was probably a lot more for, may have been for um, flood control and also for a lot of hydroelectric mm -hmm. dams. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But wherever it is, habitat's been a huge issue in the restoration, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Anything in particular that you think as you look at this issue over the years that, that a lot of people might not understand about the importance of this? Because, of course, change is always hard. They look at it and say, you know, well, why, why, why are they changing it? I, I, like that, I like where that dam is. I fished there as a kid. My grandfather and I fished there and say, why do they have to change it? Is that the hard question that you get? It's, it's a hard question for the people that don't understand kind of the background. We have kind of the same issue up on Big Stone Lake with the Whetstone River that was diverted. And that was done back in the 30s to refill Big Stone Lake. So then you finish a drought and you go into a heavier rainfall, then all of a sudden you've got major flood issues. So in the 60s, they came back up to Ortonville to the Big Stone Lake Dam and redid that whole structure to try to pass all of that flow, which at one time they thought they wanted into the lake, and then turns out they didn't. So this is the same situation at Marsh Lake. The Palm de Terre was put in there to fill up the lake also and to hold floodwaters, and it just caused a lot of damage to Marsh Lake. Yeah, so, it, cause, cause so with multiple pieces, it's the dam, yes. it's... It's the rechannelization, changing the water course, and all of those pieces, you take, take any one of those, and suddenly you've got dramatic changes across the whole ecosystem. Correct. Yeah. Um, what about funding for this? Now, that's what's really driving this right now. In the last year or so, we've seen funding, funding change, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, legacy fundings for the state. That's where Lassard Sam's, the Outdoor Heritage Council, that's where the funding will be coming from the state. And without that legacy funding passing, it would have been very difficult for the state to come up with their share of the money for this project. Yeah, and Dwight, of course, you know, federal funds are involved as well, right? Yes, yeah. that, is, that is correct. Um, so I know, as you alluded to earlier, we got the $7.6 million. Um, um, we, you know, we have that right now, and we're moving forward. And, you know, things are just great, and I think everyone involved with this process is extremely positive. Yeah, and that's also, I think, something difficult for people to grasp is that these things not only take a long time, but they're also very expensive, and, and I think if you look at a dam in Kansas City, how, how do you get that out of there? How long does it take? How challenging it is? And you're also talking about an area that, in many cases, with rechannelizing a river, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of space, takes a lot of time. Yes. Yeah. Um, what about people getting involved? Because, I mean, I know that there are public meetings that have been held, so if people want to know more about these projects or, or get involved and learn more about them, how, how do they find out about 
what these projects mean to communities. Diane? Uh, they can definitely contact us at the Watershed District, and we actually have a citizens advisory network that we try throughout our entire basin. We would love to have anybody that's involved in any of these projects. All they can do is contact us, and we can get them as part of the committee and keep them up to date on everything that's happening in our area. Well, and for the Army Corps? Um, right now we've finished uh, most of our public review um, sessions, so we're just finalizing all of our, our drawings and just getting ready to execute. So, um, you know, for, for us, we won't really have um, any way for the public at this time, um, you know, to participate, but uh, hopefully they'll just uh, see the great work out there and, and know that we're working. When you mentioned participation, it made me think of recreation because, of course, we've talked about, you know, fish habitats. We've talked about, you know, what it's going to look like, how it might be different. But what about recreation? Because how do these projects sometimes change the way that people use the river? Kayaks, canoes, other boats? Uh, Diane, I'll start Absolutely. with Absolutely. And another thing that's happening right now that I'm, I don't know if everybody's aware of is I believe the city of Appleton is taking the bike trail out to Marsh Lake, but we are currently working with DNR to take it all the way through Marsh Lake and hopefully someday connect actually to the bike trail in Ortonville. So it would be nice to have that whole connection from all the way from Big Stone Lake all the way down to Marsh Lake. So for people who aren't familiar with the area, how long are we talking about in terms of miles? And quantify this a bit. Um, I would say from town it must be about two miles. It would be a total of three, three and a half miles, I think, okay. of total trail. And then to connect up with any much longer with, trail. With Ortonville, then you'd have to get down to the Big Stone National Wildlife Refuge, which is probably 20 miles. And so that is an important issue, I think, for people who are looking at tourism in the region. Correct. Because now you've got a bike trail, you've got water, you've got natural areas, and you can tie it all together. Yes. Yeah. And Dwight, is that also something that, that we see in, in projects like this in other parts of the country, do you think, or other parts, is tying in, you know, the use patterns and trails and those kinds of things? Is that also common? That, that, that is very common, um, especially when you look at ecosystem restoration projects or really any project that we do. Um, that is a component that we look at um, because... A lot of times we have to look at the beneficial use as well. And so I, I know that during this project, um, we've been in close coordination, you know, with the watershed district on this issue, as well as uh, the Minnesota DNR, Department of Natural Resources. And, uh, you know, we're working the issues to um, assist them in getting that bike trail. I'd like to touch on that because you just talked about partners there. So we, let, let, let's go through this, make sure we get, we got, because <laughs> it's a lot of people, yes. which is another part. So we've got the Army Corps of Eng Engineers, the Upper Minnesota River Watershed District, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, because mm -hmm. acronyms get thrown out, yes. sometimes we don't always know who they are. Who else? Who else? And, and then we've got tourism people, because we've got the city of Appleton, and then we've got trails. Who else? Have we missed anybody? Um, DNR has two different divisions. Their division of waters and, well, actually three. Okay. It's waters, it's wildlife, and it's fisheries. So there's three separate divisions there, and parks and trails. Mm -hmm because they all have a vested interest in different portions of the project, which is pretty unique in that way. Sure, and they might not all, and, and a lot of these people might be working, you know, typically in very different paths, because one is concerned about habitat, one's concerned about use, another is concerned about hydrology, right? Correct. Yeah, so this is another reason why it may take decades. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I should, to, to be fair, we're getting very close to having it now. Yes, so, that yeah, is correct. Yeah. And the uh, other thing I would like to say is our uh, federal legislators have been very instrumental in this project. They fought out in Washington for many, many years to get this funding, and they finally did it this year. Yeah. So we're very thankful for that. So, and I know this has been something people have been talking about for many, many years, but you know, how difficult is it to get you know, sort of the funding pieces put together that you need for rural river restoration projects? I mean, taking out one dam might not be so much, but for these larger ones, this, is it extremely difficult to really get all of the pieces put together? I think <laughs> it, it's you know it's a it's kind of the the gifts and the curse you know we are ven uh, very beneficial to have great partners and you can see uh, working with the uh, Upper Minnesota River Watershed District and the and the DNR um, even you know Fish and Wildlife U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service there's another one yep there's yeah, another there's one the okay. yep we, we have lots of partners in this and such and because we have such good coordination and you know everyone is really about this project it's a no brainer we have to do it there's there's no way that we can um, so we have a strong case because when we when we send this up to Congress um, we're fighting against all the other districts for very limited resources as we know 
so, when you say all the other Army Corps districts. Yes, that's okay. correct. Yeah. All the other U.S. Army Corps of Engineers districts. So, you know, for us to not only get uh, this um, authorized um, in 2014, but then to be appropriated um, with the funding of 7.6, and normally that doesn't happen because now we have all the construction money at once. Many times with these projects, it's uh, the funding is split into multiple years. So you might get five million here, you might get another, you know, two million here to finish it off. So we were very fortunate to get all the funding at once, so we can do this project all at once, and there'll be no delay once we start. Because I imagine the other hard part then is if you phase in a project and you're talking about an ecosystem, how, where would you? I mean, I, I'm sure you have experience with that, but phasing in whether it's this project or something else would mean trying to figure out what little piece of it do you take off yeah, first, right? That is correct. Because you can't just take off part of a, of a, of a, of a water course. Yeah, right. You can't just rechannel something. And that's mm -hmm. another thing that I think can delay these things sometimes. Yes. Oh, that's a lot to think about. Um, river restoration projects, are there other things that we should look forward to in the future? I mean, as people have a, a wish list or projects, as Marsh Lake's been on the list for a long time, what are some other things, you know, either in the Minnesota River Valley or let's just say even broader in the, in the district for the core, you know, next sort of things that people can look forward to? Um, currently, the watershed districts, we are in the process of doing our um, watershed restoration project. And so after the next four years, right now we're doing all the water quality monitoring. We're coming up for strategies to address all of the issues we have for water quality issues. And then once we get our strategy, then you apply for funding to do the best management practices to improve the water quality. So that's going to be huge over the next 15 to 20 years. To pull all of those pieces together, yep. Dwight. Um, you know, a lot of what we do, Les, is we work with the local communities, the districts, uh, the municipalities, and they come to us, and, and and we look at it with them, and we start to develop our strategies based off of what's the concerns, you know, of those uh, people uh, asking for support. So we're just waiting. So so whenever you guys are ready, you know, please, you know, let us know, and we'll definitely, um, you know, we'll work with you guys as you know. Um, you know, and, and try to be, you know, make something beneficial for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, so from your perspective, I suppose, in some ways, the engineering is the easy part. It's all of the planning that has to go into it ahead of time, right? <laughs> it's, right. It's, it's, yes. it's the planning, it's the waiting, it's the funding, it's all of the other piece. Yes, it's, it's the management part that's uh, a lot of times the toughest. You know, I um, have a great team of engineers uh, back at St. Paul, and they do great work. But for them, you know, all they have to do is make sure that, you know, that this is going to work, uh, this isn't going to be breached, uh, that we have everything, you know, correct. And, you know, kind of from my standpoint, being a project manager, it's like, you know, well, you got check the funding, make sure everything, public reviews are done, that all the legal concerns have been addressed, that we have all the right, you know, we're NEPA compliant. So it's a lot of other things to make sure holistically that the project is going forward. Um, so yes, I wish I could do some engineering right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I think I've talked to a number of people in natural resource management who talk about the fact that they got into it to work, to get to sort of get their hands dirty, you know, and get into these projects. And then, of course, it becomes about figuring out all of the other pieces that yeah. need to go into it. So um, final word here, we got about a minute left for people who want more information, uh, websites that they could go to. Yep, um, go to umrwd.org. UM, umrwd, which is the Upper Minnesota River Watershed, Watershed District. District .org. Okay. And we're all listed on there. All of our emails are listed on there. Contact us at any time. And same thing for the Army Corps. I mean, the Army Corps, I know I've checked out the website myself, so I know there's a lot there. Right? Yes, there's a lot there, and, um, you know, we send out press releases. We also have a, a Facebook page, um, St. Paul District, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, that will okay. put information. So Great, great. Diane Rademacher, Dwight Howell, thanks for joining us on Compass. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. That's it for this week on Compass. Join us next week for more people, places, and issues facing our region. Thanks.